So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are at this moment. Let me thank the ACV and in particular the organizing team for including uh, our work in this uh, monetary conference, monetary policy conference. And as Isabel mentioned, the, the topic of the, of the paper and of my, of my presentation will be monetary policy with opinionated markets and uh, is joint work with ALP. But before getting into that paper, I'd like to describe very briefly uh, our broad agenda. And it's an agenda that we like to describe as a recentric macro or recentric macro policy. And the basic idea is, is very simple. You know, in, in, the, in macroeconomics, uh, we typically, uh, we, actually in any economy, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a productive capacity and that productive capacity can produce certain amount of goods. That's what we call the supply of goods, a potential supply. And then most macro models and certainly a lot of macroeconomic policy is about an absorption problem. It's how to find the right demand for that amount of supply. No? And now a productive capacity also produces risks, which is embedded in, in the assets in the economy. And so there's also a supply of risk in the economy. And this, in that sense, it's a second absorption problem, which is to find the right demand for all the risk produced by the, by the productive capacity. So macro is mostly about the top row. Finance, especially asset pricing, is mostly about the bottom row. But it turns out that these boxes are obviously connected, and the, and the linkage between these box, these rows, is asset prices. Very broadly understood. I mean, asset, stock markets, bond prices, spreads, uh, house prices, and, and so on. Okay. And now, I think this, this distinction is very important for central banks in particular, because most of the objectives of central banks are in terms defined in terms of the upper row. But it turns out that the place where they operate is really the bottom row. Okay. And so, so this linkage is, is very important for central bank policy in general. Now, once you start thinking about macro uh, in terms of this bottom row, you have to think about things that are important for financial markets. And one of the key things that is, important, that, that is important for financial markets is beliefs. A lot of speculation, trading, and so on is a result of beliefs, difference in beliefs, and so on. Huge role. And so with this perspective, those issues of beliefs and things that are specific, in principle specific to financial markets, become issues that are important for macroeconomic policy as well. So in previous papers, what we have done is we have looked at belief heterogeneity within the private sector and have looked at what are the implications for that, for example, for macroprudential policy, for prudential monetary policy, for large scale asset purchases and things of that kind. Now, in the paper that I'm gonna to present today though, we don't look at differences of beliefs within the private sector, but a difference of beliefs between the private sector, which we wanna call the market and the central bank. And apologies for calling the central bank the Fed, maybe I should have called it the ACB for this conference. But as we will see later on, I'm going to be talking about policy mistakes all the time. So it may be better that, that I talk about the Fed rather than the ECB. So one very clear source of disagreement is in, uh, in the forecast of future interest rates. So what you have in this picture here is, is, the, is the, in the thin line is the federal funds rate, the path of the actual federal funds rate. And what you see in the thicker color lines uh, are uh, uh, for workers, and dots, so the projections by the central banks are summarized by the average dot, okay? So this is right after though the FOMC meetings where the dots are released, you can also look at the, at the forward curve and compare these two curves. And you can see that, that there are very clear differences and at times they're very similar, but at times they're very big differences. Now you can adjust these pictures in many ways, you can add a risk premium that actually compresses on average the difference, but it's very small relative to the size of the departures you see there. You can, rather than looking at dots, I mean, there's a lot of issues of what dots you, they, they really represent, but you can look at the interest rates implicit in the green book, for example, compare it with blue chips, and you see sort of similar big differences. I mean, you can see it also beyond the US and most central banks that we have access to data that do publish this forecast, you do see difference between the corresponding market curve and, uh, and the forecast. Okay. So uh, there is a literature in, in, in macro that, that thinks about information problems between the central bank and the private sector. And it's mostly about asymmetric information. And the presumption there is typically that, well, the Fed knows more about obviously its actions, but it also knows more about the economy. 
So, so it's, a, it's a perspective in which the market is a little is passive, waiting for this great wisdom to come down to them uh, from the central banks. But first of all, that cannot explain the picture that I just described because those are disagreements expressed after the FOMC made its announcement. Okay, so the great truth has been revealed already to the markets, and you still see these big, big differences. But second, and more importantly, perhaps, is that you know I had a midlife crisis and I spent a couple of years in hedge funds outside of academia, and I came back to academia precisely when this literature was developing in, in, in macro. And it did not sort of match very well with the views I, I, I saw traders express. In fact, traders are very opinionated people. They are certainly observing very closely what the Fed and central banks are doing around the world, but mostly to confirm whether the banks get the right, have the right view or not in their perspective, the right view. A concrete example beyond my personal experience is December 2007. There, there was a hawkish interest rate cut by the Fed that led to sort of asset price declines and so on. Uh, and you can see in the one representative article of the reactions of the market to what the Fed, the Fed actions is uh, expressed in the Wall Street Journal is, uh, here's a quote, from talking to clients and traders, there is in their view no question the Fed has fallen behind the curve. That doesn't sound like receiving the great wisdom. They say, look, they are not getting it. Said David Greenlow, economist at Morgan Stanley, there's a growing sense that the Fed doesn't get it. Okay, I'm not saying the market is right or wrong, but it's clear that it's not about having received information from the Fed is about not agreeing with what the Fed has just revealed. So what do we do in this paper? We essentially say it's a theory paper. We, pro, we, produce a mo, a mo, a paper, uh, we provide a model of uh, uh, the, uh, a situation in which the Fed and the markets disagree. Okay. Uh, so we call this, it's a, that's the reason we, we call it an opinionated paper. Now, uh, uh, the paper is opinionated in itself, but, but the markets are opinionated in our model. And so is the Fed, by the way. So we develop a model with opinionated markets and opinionated Fed. So the key features of this model is that first, the Fed and the market are going to disagree about something. They can disagree about many things, but the particular thing we will look at is disagreement about future aggregate demand. Okay. And the second feature the model will have is that they both learn from the data. Okay. Now, the, the players are going to agree to disagree, and they know how, what, what is the disagreement, so they know the beliefs of the other player, and they also know that each agent will learn as data comes along. Okay. So what are the main findings and the ones I'm, I'm going to explain uh, mostly in this, in this presentation? Uh, the first is that this, this environment pro provides a very natural explanation for the disagreements about interest rate that, that I showed you before in the figure. Okay. And the second, that perhaps more important uh, for this conference, is that these disagreements matter for optimal monetary policy. Okay. For optimal monetary policy. Certainly matter for the impact of monetary policy, but it also matters for the design of monetary policy. Now, the paper has several extensions, and I doubt that I will get the time to to discuss them, certainly not in detail, but let me tell you what these extensions are. The first one, in the basic model, prices are going to be completely sticky, but then we're going to add a Neocanesian Phillips curve. And, and the, the, the main uh, results of that section is that, yeah, you get more or less the same as you, the main conclusions survive that environment. But the most interesting aspect is you want to connect, for example, with Clarida Galli and Gertler, the classic paper on, on, on the science and or art or science of monetary policy, is that now you can think of this agreement as endogenous cost push shocks. Okay, remember cost push shocks is what in that environment breaks the divine coincidence. Well, it, having disagreements produces something very similar to that in a very formal sense. Um, the second extension is, well, what if we bring into this framework also information asymmetries of the kind that sort of are, have been developed in the macro literature? And the main results there is that, well, first, the main results of our paper survive, but more interesting than that, now there's a second dimension of disagreement because the Fed may not know whether the market is willing to agree that that's the signal, the private signal the Fed has is informative or not. And that can lead to sort of the perception of monetary shocks or information. It may vary depending on the particular market that the Fed faces, and that in itself brings reluctance to act from the point of view of the Fed, because it doesn't know whether the market will react positively or not to the information is about to be revealed. And the last extension is about heterogeneous data sensitivity. So the Fed and the markets need not be equally data dependent. They're both going to learn from data, 
but they may, they need not be equally data dependent. Some of the, the market or the Fed may learn faster than the other. And the interesting uh, implication of that extension is that now every single macroeconomic shock has implicit in it a monetary policy shock. So there's a big literature that is entangling you know, looking at the impact of monetary shocks that typically as isolates high frequency events around FOMC announcements. Well, once you have this heterogeneous data sensitivity, then it turns out that any, any, any macro shock uh, comes with an implicit, or the market can focus at that moment, that the Fed will react in a certain way, and the market may not agree with that certain way it expects the market to react. So every single macro shock becomes a, a compounded macro shock with a monetary policy shock. Okay, good. So that's what the paper does. So let me, I, I will essentially uh, describe the paper uh, twice. Once in words and diagrams, and then uh, the second time, it's also going to be in words and diagrams, but it's going to be a couple of equations more. Okay, but 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 you're gonna. I'm gonna sound repetitive. It's deliberate. Okay, so let me first tell you what the setup is, uh, and and what are the main results, and what what features of the setup give us give uh, uh, these main results. So the first thing is we're gonna have aggregate demand shocks. That's what we're, the markets and 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 the, and the Fed are gonna disagree about. Now, what is an aggregate demand shock for us? Is something that moves current expenditure given potential out. Okay, that's the definition of an aggregate demand shock. And there's many different sources for aggregate demand shock. In fact, the aggregate demand shock that we're going to model, the specific aggregate demand shock, is going to be the most aggregate supply looking aggregate demand model. You can imagine because it's going to be future productivity shocks. Okay, so today we're going to learn about future productivity. Well, that will have an effect on today's expenditure. And that's usually going to have a, it's going to be an aggregate demand shock for today, and it's an aggregate supply shock for the future. But we're going to look at the current episode. So in the current period, we're going to have an aggregate demand shock. The Fed is going to have to take actions that set the interest rate, give speeches, whatever, uh, uh, before it knows the current aggregate demand shock. Okay, so it's going to have to make a monetary policy decision. Now, the Fed is going to set the interest rate targeting a zero output gap. Now, it's a zero output gap under the Fed's beliefs. That's an important distinction now. Now, the Fed has beliefs, that's a superscript F, that, that's what it denotes, and it's going to try to set an interest rate that, uh, that, that gives on average, on average across all these aggregate demand shocks, a, a zero output gap. <coughs> now, after this, the, the, the Fed has set the interest rate for this period and the, and the, and the aggregate demand shock takes place, the market sets uh, the output gap. No? <laughs> it's equilibrium. You know? It knows the interest rate and it knows uh, uh, what the aggregate demand shocks, so it determines equilibrium output, okay? Now, uh, uh, if the Fed doesn't think that the, the Fed has the right beliefs, that this F is not the right uh, belief, then this equilibrium output here will depend on what the market perceives to be a Fed mistake. So let me explain that, and that will take us to the first result and perhaps the most important result for a central bank of this paper. So, <coughs> Here is the period I just described, the current period. Remember what I said, the Fed will target, will set an interest rate to try to set an average output under its beliefs equal to zero, output gap equal to zero. Now the market is gonna set output here, but when it sets output, it not only cares about the current aggregate demand shock, it not only cares about the current interest rate, but it also cares about what it expects monetary policy to be in the future, okay? See, in particular, suppose that the market believes that, uh, that the Fed is being too hawkish, that it thinks that the future is a lot rosier than the market thinks. Then, well, that of course is going to affect the current interest rate, and that's going to affect the out actual output gap. But it would also affect the perception that the market has about future output gaps. It understands that the Fed will set the interest rate in the future in order to set an average output gap equal to zero under the Fed's belief, which the market perceives to be a hawkish belief. So that means that will depress current output. It will depress current output for any given interest rate because now the market expects the future interest rate to be too high for what the market expects to be the actual macroeconomic environment, the actual level of aggregate demand. But the Fed understands that the market will believe that the Fed will make a mistake. So when the Fed sets the interest rate here, 
for this period, it also has to internalize that the market will perceive a future mistake from the point of view of the Fed. So the future perception of mistakes by the market or the Fed believes also affect the current interest rate, uh, in, uh, the, the interest rate that the Fed sets today. Okay, so, <clears throat> and that's the main result for monetary policy, because it says the Fed will, ha will have to partially accommodate the market, and will have to do so to mitigate the impact that the perceived mistakes by the market, the perceived mistakes of the Fed by the market, have on aggregate demand. Okay. Now, very naturally, if these beliefs are very entrenched, and therefore the disagreements are very entrenched, and they're likely to affect the, 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 the future for a long time, then the Fed needs to accommodate even more uh, the market. In fact, we have an extreme result in the paper in which the, if the two sides are completely stubborn and they're never willing to learn, uh, uh, then, then the Fed should follow the market and ignore its own beliefs. Not, we're not going to look at that extreme in the paper, so there's somewhere in between, but you get, you get the, 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 the effect at least that the more entrenched these beliefs are, the more the Fed needs to accommodate the market. So that's going to be our first main result. <laughs> the second main result is explained in figure one. How can you have even after the Fed has revealed all its wind wisdom, how can you have different curves, future curves, future different forecasts about future interest rates? And that's when the learning block uh, plays a very important role. So let me explain. So this is, remember, this is, uh, this is the, the current period. That's what I just explained in, in the previous slide. And we, are, and we agree, meaning you, the audience, and, and me, the presenter, we agree that the Fed will set an interest rate taking into account its own beliefs at day one, at the first period, and also the market's belief. In particular, I said, well, the market, the Fed will set the interest rate trying to set the average output gap to zero in this period according to its own belief. But it, for, in order to do that successfully, it has to take into account and accommodate its interest rate policy to the market's beliefs. Okay. Okay. So there is no disagreement today about what the interest rate is today. The market, the Fed will set an interest rate. The market cannot disagree about the Fed, the interest rate that was set by the market. So there's no disagreement about this uh, uh, interest rate. It is what it is. But there's, there is disagreement about the, what the future interest rate will be. And that's what I show you in the first figure. And how, does that, how can that happen? Well, <coughs> think what, what happens at day one. At day one, the, the, the Fed says, OK, I know that you know the market has these distorted beliefs. I, I think the market is, is really dovish. It doesn't understand that aggregate demand uh, is, is, is uh, it doesn't understand that aggregate demand will be better on average than what they expect. I cannot do much today about that. I have to accommodate a lot. But I know that in between this decision and the next decision, there will be an aggregate demand shock. And I, I'm the Fed. I think I'm right. I believe in my beliefs. So I think this aggregate demand shock, on average, is not going to be a surprise to me in terms of realization, but it's going to be a positive surprise for the market. Okay, I, and the mass market is going to be surprised on, on, for, with how good this aggregate demand shock will be. And because of that, I expect the market to update its beliefs. So I expect for the next period, the market. So when I have to set, I'm the Fed. I had to set the interest rate in the next period. I expect to have the same beliefs, actually, that are more or less the same beliefs I have today, but I expect the market to have more optimistic beliefs than it has today, because it's going to be surprised by a positive aggregate demand shock. And therefore, since I'm going to be dealing with a market that is more optimistic than the market I'm dealing with today, I expect tomorrow to be able to set a higher interest rate, one that is closer to the beliefs I have. And that's the reason the dot curve is upward sloping. I have to accommodate a lot today. I expect these guys to be positively surprised between today and tomorrow. And therefore, tomorrow, I expect to be able to set a higher interest rate. What about the market? Well, the market also thinks the market is right. And the market says, well, I cannot disagree with the Fed today. It's, the interest rate is whatever it is. But you know, I know it's going to be an aggregate demand shock here. I know the Fed is going to realize that it was way too optimistic when it was setting this interest rate. On average, I think they, they're going to get a negative surprise on aggregate demand. So I expect to encounter in the next period a Fed that has an F2 lower, oops, sorry, than F1. Okay, a Fed that is is is, is less hawkish than I'm facing today. So as a market, I expect the interest rate to go down. Why is that? Again, because I expect the Fed to learn that uh, the war is a, li a little worse 
than, than the Fed thinks at day one. Okay, and so that's exactly what explains so disagreement plus learning. If there's no learning, there's no way of, there's nothing you can do. If we disagree completely, we're gonna convert to some interest rate, but we're not gonna disagree about the future either because there's no learning along the way. It is the learning aspect that allows us to have this difference between uh, 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 the dot curve and the forward curve or the Greenspan book uh, forecast and uh, the blue chip forecast and so on. Okay. So that's what the really that's what the core of the paper is uh, about. Now, let me go over the paper again, trying to uh, uh, tell you a little bit more about those results and a little bit more about the extensions, the extensions. But before doing that, this um, the small section. This again is a theory paper, but it's a small empirical section motivating our basic ingredients. And uh, I'm not going to present that, but I'm going to show you one picture that I think captures what is in that section. Uh, we, there, isn't, there isn't a lot of data on, on disagreements between the Fed and, uh, uh, and the market, but there's a lot more data about disagreements uh, between different financial institutions, big financial institutions. There's blue chips data that has a much longer data set. So we use this blue chip data uh, to essentially demonstrate two points which are important for uh, our model. The first one is that interest rate forecasts correlate with aggregate demand perceptions. So, so, so if, if we want a financial institutions that forecast a higher interest rate, we'll also be forecasting higher aggregate demand, which we're gonna measure as inflation. And the second feature we want is that these forecasts are confident disagreements. So even after you include all common information and so on, uh, they still disagree. And not only they still disagree, they continue to disagree over time. Okay, so this, they're persistent disagreements. And those two features you can capture in, in this picture here. What you have is on the top figure, you have the federal funds rate, three quarters, so the forecast of the federal funds rate, three quarters ahead uh, for different financial institutions. The green one is the consensus, the blue one is Goldman, and the red one is uh, Bear Stern. And you can clearly see that before the, the global financial crisis, uh, Bear Stearns was uh, had higher forecast of interest rate and in the lower diagram, diagram, you see the focus they have on, on, on inflation, and you can see that the, that uh, Bear Stearns was far more optimistic than Goldman about future aggregate demand. And as a result of that, they did have a higher uh, focus for interest rate. Now, we all know the reason this line ends here is that clearly Goldman was a lot closer to reality than, than Bear Stearns, uh, but you know, there are consequences of these big disagreements. Uh, that's what you see here. But you also see the second point, which is that these disagreements are fairly persistent. Okay, you can see sort of long periods where you see gaps in, in both forecasts of interest rate and disagreements about the aggregate demand. And then again, in the paper, there are some regressions and so on that drew this paper, this more this stuff more formally with all sort of individual effects, time effects, and stuff like that. So let me again uh, get into uh, the model um, and. Uh, it's, it's, again, you're not going to be able to fully understand the model because I'm going to skip almost the model, but I want to give you a couple of equations. So a few diagrams I show you later on make a little more sense. The first slide is just to tell you that, that the basic macro model has nothing new. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an off-the-shelf uh, New Keynesian model with aggregate demand shocks. So standard preferences, uh, a monopolistic competition, in the basic model, we're going to assume fully sticky prices. So, and all the firms have exactly the same prices. All the, there's no idiosyncratic shocks here. All the firms have the same productivity, okay, AT. The aggregate demand shock, as I told you before, is going to be the most supply looking aggregate demand shock. At any time T, there's going to be a level of uh, aggregate productivity, AT, but we're going to also learn about productivity in the next period, okay? So GT is going to be the, the aggregate demand shock. We're going to call it the aggregate demand shock, is really the productivity growth shock, but it cannot affect a potential output today, but it will affect aggregate demand. So you combine this and you get a very pretty standard, you log linearize a standard New Keynesian model. In the, in the version of the paper that you may have seen, we don't have linearization and everything's a little bit more complicated. There's risk premium floating around and so on. In the version I'm presenting here and the one we're gonna post next, uh, we may have just posted yesterday, uh, we log linearize, so, so it's much more sort of standard macro stuff. And, uh, and so we get a standard log linearized IS curve, 
uh, in which you know the current output gap is a decreasing function of the interest rate set by the Fed, is an increasing function of the realization of the aggregate demand shock, and is an increasing function of the expectation of the market about future aggregate demand. Okay. And in the previous version of the paper, here you have asset prices and stuff like that. And there is a one-to-one -one relationship between future aggregate demand and asset prices in, the, in, this, in this paper. Okay, so that's the standard IS curve. And again, in which now I need to highlight this M here because it's the markets believe that matters uh, for the actual output gap. Now, monetary policy without commitment is going to be essentially the, the Fed trying to set this output gap equal to zero under its own beliefs, so F, okay? So F and M will be different. And so this interest, so where do we see the Fed's beliefs here? Well, is in setting this interest rate. When the Fed is gonna, the only tool we'll have is to set this interest at IT, so it expects this, this, the expectation of this to be equal to zero, okay? So what are the main equations we get out of this frame? This. So let me remind you what I just showed you. The yes is this. So <clears throat> what is the equilibrium interest rate? That is the interest rate set by the Fed, okay? But after it considers all the beliefs of the markets and so on, and its own belief. Remember what it's trying to do is taking the expectation of this expression of the yes under its own beliefs and it's setting it equal to zero. So from that, you solve for the interest rate, no? Set this equal to zero, that gives you the interest rate. Then you have to put an expectation here under the Fed's belief, and that gives you the interest rate. So the equilibrium interest rate, the interest rate set by the Fed, is obviously going to be an increasing function of the Fed's belief about the aggregate demand shock for this period. If the Fed believes that the aggregate demand shock will be very high, it's a very optimistic belief, then you're going to set a higher interest rate naturally. But, and the, 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 the term that comes from uh, uh, the, the, uh, the beliefs of, of the markets uh, is, is the second term, which is, well, the Fed is also going to set a higher interest rate if it expects the market to have a very optimistic belief. Okay, so if the Fed, the Fed expects the market to expect a positive output gap, uh, given the interest rate policy of the Fed, then the Fed is going to have to increase the interest rate to accommodate that. Conversely, if the Fed expects the market to uh, be more pessimistic, uh, then it's going to have to lower interest rate to accommodate the pessimism that the market has. So that's uh, the optimal policy under the Fed belief. So the Fed is not betraying its belief. The Fed is optimizing. The Fed is trying to set the output gap to zero under its beliefs. But it turns out that in order to do so, it has to deal with the beliefs of the market. And that's what we capture in this term here. Now, replace this interest rate up here and you get the equilibrium output gap. So the equilibrium output gap is what? Is, is a result of a surprise according to the Fed belief. So if aggregate demand turns out to be higher than what the Fed expected, then out, the output gap will be positive. Uh, output will be above uh, potential output. Aggregate demand will be above potential output. And it will also be a function of the su surprise for the Fed on the degree of optimism of the market. So the Fed has, a, has an expectation about the degree of optimism or pessimism of the market. But it turns out that the market may end up being more optimistic or more uh, pessimistic than the Fed expected, and that's also going to affect aggregate demand. Okay. Now, in, in what I'm going to say today, I'm not going to talk really very much about this term. This is one of the extensions. Uh, we're going to be mostly in this environment here. So, but let me move on. Uh, I have, I think, six minutes more, no? More or less that, or seven minutes more. So, let me give you the last ingredient and then just pictures from here on. So the last ingredient is, well, where do these beliefs come from and what are they about? So this is the way we model it. So the growth rate and therefore the aggregate demand shocks is going to, are going to, be, is going to be equal to some parameter G plus an unknown component and plus noise. So in every period, there's going to be shocks, IAD shocks and so on. The disagreements and the beliefs are about this unknown component. How much of the level of aggregate demand we're seeing is permanent or semi-permanent versus how much is noise. That's what the market and the Fed are going to disagree about. So they're going to have different beliefs, different priors, and then different posteriors that are going to start to converge over time, but different priors about this, and this, this permanent component of aggregate demand. And so this prior, the, again, the Fed and the market will have different, that J is the Fed and the market, and, there, and there's also a certain amount of confidence, no? 
C will capture the amount of confidence that each of these players have on their own beliefs. If the market is, if, if the players are very, no, I'm not going to look at the heterogeneous uh, confidence and, and for most of the talk. So assume that they have the same confidence. If the, if the players are very confident, then the, 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 the priors are going to count. Therefore, the difference are going to count for a very long time because they're not going to learn a lot with data. If they if they are not very confident about their priors, then they're going to learn fairly quickly, and therefore the disagreements are also going to converge fairly quickly. Okay, um, let me uh, skip a few things. So, uh, so news are going to be here. Uh, expectations about uh, about aggregate demand. So this this picture is important, and then I, uh, and, and then I'm going to get back to the results I already explained, but using a different diet. So suppose that we start this, this model with a, 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 a Fed that is more optimistic than the market. So this is the expected aggregate demand by the Fed for, for this period, and this is for the market. So the Fed is more optimistic. So what this figure shows is, well, what does the Fed expect to expect in the future about aggregate demand? Well, the Fed expects to expect the same about aggregate demand in the future, because it, the Fed thinks it has the right beliefs. So the future, the expectation, today's expectation by the Fed of its own future expectations is a flat line. It's expect to expect the same. What about the market? Well, the market expects to expect exactly the same aggregate demand in the future. Okay, so the expectation for its own expectation of the market is also flat. But the expectation of the market for the Fed is downward sloping because it expects the, the Fed to learn that the conditions are worse than it expects over time. So the expectations of the market for the Fed is downward sloping. Conversely, the expectation of the Fed for the market expectations is upward sloping because it expects the market to figure out over time as it learns that, uh, um, that it got the expectations wrong here. They had the wrong beliefs. And uh, so it expects the market to come to the Fed's beliefs. So here is disagreement. So imagine a situation where let me look at the left diagram here. So what I'm showing here is what happens so when there is a, it's a shock to beliefs. So suppose that, that both the market and the, and the Fed have, this, have these levels of belief. Let me give you first a benchmark. Suppose that both become more optimistic. And now the, both believe that the aggregate demand conditions is better, so that the, this, this permanent component of aggregate demand is better. Then what will happen is that the interest rate the dot curve and the, Fed and, and, and the four workers are going to coincide at a much higher level. No? Both are going to go up. Suppose instead that all that happens is that the Fed uh, becomes more optimistic. So suddenly the Fed sees the future better uh, than the market sees it. Well, then what happens is, well, the Fed you know, will want to raise interest rates because it expects the aggregate amounts of prices to be positive in the future. But it knows it cannot raise interest rates too much because if it does, it does so, that's going to depress a lot the market because the market hasn't updated its belief. It does still is, remain pessimistic. So that will lead to a big uh, crash in asset markets, the collapse in aggregate demand, and so on. So the Fed cannot afford really to increase interest rate a lot. It's in this sense that the Fed needs to accommodate the market's beliefs. Okay? The Fed became optimistic. It believes that we're on a full road to recovery, but it cannot fully increase interest rate because the market is still stuck there and, 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 the, and, and, the, and the Fed wants to prevent the effect of the market's perception of the Fed's mistakes on aggregate demand. Now, why is though the curve upward sloping and this one downward sloping? Well, because of the, what I just explained. The Fed says, okay, I cannot increase the interest rate a lot today because the market is very pessimistic, but I expect the market to become increasingly optimistic over time because they're going to learn from the depreciation of aggregate demand than the market, than the, than the, that, the, that the aggregate demand is better than what they, they expect. So that's the reason the Fed can, can have a sort of upward sloping dot curve here. The market thinks the opposite. It says, no, no, no. Well, I mean, these guys, okay, these guys made a mistake. They're going to realize after they see recessions and recessions that they made a mistake. They're going to have to retrace uh, their steps and therefore we expect a lower interest rate. Now, the diagram on the right is essentially the same as the diagram on the left. The only big difference is that here the players are, don't, are not very confident on the, the belief. So they, they weigh the data a lot. Well, here they're very confident. So if you see the main difference, what I want to highlight of this picture is the main difference. The main difference is that here, when the players are very confident, the Fed has to accommodate the markets a lot more than here. And why is that? 
is because the Fed thinks, okay, I, I, I believe that, the, that aggregate conditions are, are great, uh, but I believe, and I believe that the data will prove me right, but the market uh, 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 will be very slow in learning. Worse than that, the market will think that I'm gonna be very slow in learning. So the market expects me to make lots of mistakes in the future. And so it's gonna be very depressed uh, by an increase in interest rate, okay? Because again, it's, my problem is, as a Fed is that the market it's going to be very stubborn, so it's going to continue to believe, despite the data proving me right, it's going to continue to believe that that I'm going to, I'm going to continue to make mistakes. And then since the, the market believes I'm going to make mistakes for a long time, then that's going to depress asset prices a lot. It's going to depress aggregate demand a lot, and therefore it cannot increase interest rate a lot. What happens here is the opposite. What happens here is, is okay, you know, I raise the interest rate, and I'm going to raise it more than I would have done here. Why is that? It's because I know that the market thinks I'm a fool, that I'm raising interest rate before I should have done that. But I know that the, I expect the data on average to come my way. Therefore, the, 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 the market is going to learn very quickly that, uh, that, uh, that, um, that uh, it's making a mistake. The market thinks the opposite. And that's the most important result for this. The market says, OK, the Fed made a mistake raising interest rate. But I know these guys are not are very data dependent. They're going to get very unpleasant surprises in the next period, and therefore they're going to retrace their steps very quickly. So you see, the forward curve here is very, very uh, uh, downward sloping, expecting a big reversion by the market. Okay. So there, and again, that's that's uh, that's really the summary of the core of the paper. And I think I'm beyond my time. And let me just tell you again what I what we do in the next part. In the next part. The first extension is, is we introduce a new Keynesian Phillips curve. And I think the most interesting result you get here, you get more or less the same results. But the most interesting result is that you can, uh, this is like introducing in the basic benchmark uh, model in the Claria Galli Gertel model, uh, cost push shocks. And believe this agreement act exactly as cost push shocks. And, and, and so that's, and, and, and that's interesting because you know, it breaks the, 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 the you know, then it introduces a, 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 a trade-off between stabilization of inflation and output. The second extension, as I said before, is introduced signal. Suppose the Fed uh, um, also gets a private signal. Suppose first that the market agrees that the Fed has some private signal in addition to this agreement, and then what you get is a weighted average of the result that you have in the standard signal in literature and our results. The more interesting result is that if the Fed doesn't know whether the market agrees or not on whether the Fed has a more informative signal, then it will tend to underweight its own signal because it's very scared of an overreaction by the market to the perception, to, to what, the, what the market will perceive as a, as a mistake from the point of view of the Fed of assuming that it had better information than the market. And the last extension is, is assuming is, is what happens if you have different degrees of, uh, of uh, uh, data accumulation, if you will. What happens, for example, if the data is more responsive to data than the Fed, then the most interesting insight from that section is really that every single macro shock, as I said before, has an optimism or pessimism in shock. If the Fed in particular is more uh, uh, data dependent than the market, then every time the market sees a positive shock in aggregate demand, says, oh, well, the Fed is going to get carried away with this and going to hike interest rate faster than it can, than, than it should. And so you start getting sort of high volatility in interest rates as a result. Now that may be good or bad, that's, that's a definition. Okay, good. So let me stop here. I just want to leave you with, with what we do in the paper. Sorry, I, I rush a few things, but uh, there's an optimal amount of rushing so you get to, to read the paper. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, for this very clear uh, presentation. Um, we started already getting some questions uh, on the paper, and I'm encouraging uh, the people in the session who are listening to, of course, submit more questions. The first question I have is from Anton Nakov, um, and he's asking, why doesn't the Fed update its own beliefs eventually, rather than only updating its beliefs about the market's view? And he's questioning if this learning only about other agents' learning is rational. No, no, uh, no, that's not, sorry, I, I, miss, I misspoke then. No, the, the Fed learns about updates. Both agents update their beliefs and they both converge to the truth eventually, okay? It's the, what I was showing there was not the update of beliefs. I mean, they're both Bayesian, so they, they do standard Bayesian updating. 
Uh, there's nothing. Uh, so they're both rational, given the priors. Okay, they disagree on priors, but they're both rational. The figure I show you there, and I was a little rushed, is what the Fed expects today about its expectations or beliefs being in the future. So it's fully rational not to expect to update your beliefs in any way. You expect to believe the same. You understand that you're not going to believe the same because you're going to get data along the way, but you should expect to be unbiased with respect to your beliefs. And so in that sense, it's, yes, it's rational condition on uh, uh, the prior. Thanks for the clarification. A uh, second question that we came in is uh, one tied more to concrete policy. What are really the policy implications um, from your paper? This is a question by Diego Rodriguez Palenzuela. Um, he's asking, should we expect more transparency uh, from the Fed or should the Fed be using the belief asymmetry? What is your view there? Well, uh, uh, this is not a communic communications paper and it's a very interesting paper one could write about communication. Uh, but you already have a policy conclusion in the, in the paper, which is, look, the Fed needs to accommodate the beliefs of the market and it needs to accommodate the, the beliefs of the market. Of course, it may try to influence the beliefs as well. And that's what the information part has. You may try to influence the beliefs and you can give speeches and so on to try to influence the beliefs. But at any point in time, you are going to have some disagreements in belief. And this paper tells you, you should wait, you should give way to those beliefs. And, uh, and, uh, and especially if you think that those are very entrenched beliefs. So that's, that's what, the, what the paper tells you. And especially if, if you think that the market thinks that your beliefs are very entrenched. And so in that sense, for example, sometimes saying, look, I'm going to be very data dependent. is a way of communicating to the market. Look, my beliefs are not that entrenched. I'm going to be very flexible. Well, that will help you here in the sense that it will give you more space to move interest rate because you're saying, look, uh, uh, I'm going to react to data very quickly. So, so don't be afraid that I may be making a mistake, but I'm not going to make mistakes for a very long period of time. <laughs> no, that's, that's, a, that's, so this has obviously lots of implications for communication. This paper in particular is not about communication, but, but it has. And then in the final section, which I was uh, in one of the section, extension section, uh, a point I made obviously way too rush, is one about what happens when you don't know how disagreeable the market is. So, you know, if you don't know, if you have a view on the market, but, but you don't have a very clear sense on whether the market is likely to believe your view or not, then that will naturally lead to underweighting your beliefs, for example. That's one conclusion. Now, there are conclusions that are not in this part of the paper, but you can begin to see, especially when I add sort of the, 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 the Phillips curve there, is that you start getting some certain role for commitments and so on. Part of it is for the same reasons as you get it in Claria et al., uh, because now you have a certain, it's a sort of cost push. And so you may want to, you know, having believe, believe disagreement is like introducing a cost, it's an endogenous cost push. And you may want to alter the variance of that endogenous cost push. Yeah. So, and so, so that's another policy implication. We don't develop that in this paper, but you could imagine that. So, so I think this is lots of policy implication and, and I'm sure that, that, that uh, you're going to get even more implications than I do. A lot of food for thought for follow-up work. Um, another question that we have received is from uh, Carlo Altavilla, where he's asking, is there in your model a risk that the central bank ends up accommodating, let's say, market beliefs? And do you see that risk in actual policy making? No, well, one of the main messages was that the Fed should accommodate uh, the market's beliefs. And the question, something that the paper does, it tells you when you should accommodate more or less. You know? And that's a bit what I was saying in the previous answer, which is, look, if the market thinks that you're very stubborn and the market is in itself very stubborn, then you better accommodate a lot, otherwise you're gonna leave a big mess. Okay. Now, this is extra layer, which is the communication part. And, and, and remember, it's a weighted average. So if the market, for, if, for example, if the, if the, I had two terms. I had a term that says, look, at the end of the day, the Fed, or the ECB has to come with, it's target is using interest rate to get a zero put gap on average under its own belief. So it's not that it's giving up its belief. It's taking, it's taking an, but as part of its beliefs, is it the beliefs about, it has about the beliefs of the market and about the stubbornness of the market with respect to those beliefs and about the beliefs of the market about the stubbornness of the Fed about its own beliefs. But it's not that the Fed is giving up its belief. It's optimizing under its own beliefs. 
but it, it's acknowledging that there's a disagreement of beliefs. So it's not giving up of beliefs. If the file gave up on its beliefs, then essentially what would happen is that, that it would set exactly what the market wants. And there is a particular case where that happens, which is if the, if this, if the two agents are infinitely stubborn, then, then the, the, the Fed uh, accommodates uh, the, the, the market, sets the interest rate with the market. Why is that? Because by doing so, it still hits the, out, the output gap it wants on average. Why is that? Because what happens in that case is the following, is uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the market is very pessimistic. It gets surprised by a positive aggregate demand shock, but it's offset because the market said, oh, if the Fed is going to raise interest rate again tomorrow, this was an accident. Tomorrow is going to be terrible, and the Fed is going to give us give me this very high interest rate, and so uh, uh, you know I, I'm going to have a recession, and that term completely overwhelms the other term. So, so the Fed does the right thing by setting the interest rate the market has, but it does the right thing under its own beliefs, and so that's the nice thing. It's not, it doesn't give up its belief, but it, it, it evaluates things under its own beliefs. The question is, what does it have to do in order to get the right result under its own beliefs? I'm going to stop here because I don't want to crowd out Giovanni, I think. Well, one final oh, you, question. You decide that, but I can see Giovanni. Yeah. In the back, so it's, uh, we have one um, final question also from Anton Nako. If there are questions, uh, I think it went. It's a super interesting discussion. <laughs> I had one follow up question, Anton. Um, because it goes a bit in the other direction now. Could, could the Fed actually be trying to influence the market belief? So, one question was, of course. Um, to what extent uh, the market should influence the Fed. The other question is whether the Fed should be influencing the market beliefs. For sure. As I said, this is not a... Well, uh, um, both things are true, by the way. Again, this is not a communications paper, although it has an information asymmetry section at the end in which the Fed, in which everyone knows that the Fed knows a little bit more. So when the Fed does something, it does affect the, the market's belief. Okay? So, so we do have that. That's one in which, but it's obvious that there's enormous play for, for communication here. And, and how do agents form beliefs? The, the, the novelty of the paper is the disagreement component. Uh, but obviously, there is value in, in, in having convergence uh, in beliefs. And if there are other tools to do so, uh, then of, of course you should use them. Uh, uh, and, and in practice, they do use them. I mean, that's the reason uh, Fed, Fed members uh, give speeches and. Uh, and so on, and, and it's also uh, there is a two-way communication. There is no doubt that the market is also telling things uh, to the Fed. Uh, 